everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, as I said, I'm really digging into going into this DFIR journey and it's very overwhelming. So I've invited another friend to join me and really just explain what they do, how they got into it, what we should do, just kind of center our questions. So my friend, would you mind introducing yourself and telling us what it is you do? Hi, I'm Tracy Maley from also known as InfoSec Sherpa, and I am a security researcher for the Krebs Stamos Group. I love titles because we can have 15 different titles that mean the exact same thing, so you never figure it out. So I, I hate it's I'm going to sound rude, but like, what do you actually do? What is your day to day? Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I, I admit it's a little confusing. What I can easily get into is what I've done in my past jobs, and just also the whole approach of. Uh, you know, fine tuning research skills for, you know, the DFIR skill set and things like that. So I'm happy to elaborate about that places that I'm no longer with. <laughs> no problem. I mean, that's kind of what we're here is, you know, building up the journey to where you were. Kind of before we start that journey, though, I wanted to st ask, like, what got you started in it? What was that thing that went, man, I really want to dig into it and start this path? Um, I went to a two-part workshop sponsored by the Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu. It was held on the campus of the University of Maryland, which was about three hours away from where I lived. So I really wanted it because I drove down there. Uh, you know, drove six hours in a day, two days in a row, in a two two days, uh, two different weekends. And it was honestly, it was learning port scanning. It was learning a lot of the back end functions that I thought, you know, where has this been all my life? And uh, I also tell the joke of it's when I had the realization that my natural paranoia and distrust of things was a career path. And I thought, oh, okay, this is, oh, this is something you can get paid to do. Oh, okay. Like I, I already have a lot of these security principles. Um, and also I learned how to break into my own house because I used to forget my house key a lot. So uh, I used to actually, true story, used to use my library card. And this is funny because I did grow up to be a librarian. Uh, I used my library card to Lloyd the lock on my, ha my home because I used to forget my key so much. And I didn't realize that that was, again, a skill or anything. I just, it, I think it was something I saw on TV and tried it and it actually worked because the, at the time the library card was really thick plastic. Um, you know, I've been able to use my library science skills every single day. And I just, I just knew that that's what this industry needed. It, it might just kind of flow very naturally to you, but just listening and I'm sure others are going to go, wait, no, those are really basic skills that I learned, but how in the world can I actually transfer that into InfoSec? How does not having your name? I mean, I get the social engineering aspect, but obviously, you know, you've grown a bit more into other skills and everything. And so how does that leap, that connection happen? It's it's understanding the awareness of it and and what could go wrong. You know, at the bottom, the very core of it, information security, cybersecurity is risk management. You know, maybe nowadays someone, you know, Googling you, someone like myself who has an unusual name, you know, and if I walk around, like I have two baseball shirts with my last name on them that I don't want to wear anymore because now I'm aware that someone could easily, um, you know, just, just Google me and, you know, and who knows what they'll do with that information. So I think, I, I think it's, as you mature and grow, you realize the, you know, you have the awareness to put the puzzle pieces together. So it's that kind of strategic thinking, which is a transferable skill. What I'm getting is all of these skills that you're going to use in InfoSec are kind of, or sorry, uh, are kind of just these natural skills that we already have. We just get intimidated to move over and, oh, this is a business. It must be more complicated. That's some of it. I mean, I'm not going to say that every, well, let me take that back. I, I do say to people, um, you know, I do have a lot of people come to me for, for career advice and they'll say, I've only ever worked at a fast food restaurant. And I'll say, okay, I could easily name five skills off the top of my head that can be transferred from fast food into InfoSec, you know, working under pressure, 
dealing with end users slash customers, you know, multitasking, um, you know, pl- you know, uh, planning and, and management of the food, of the people, uh, you know, being aware of protocols, safety protocols, health protocols, things like that. You know, that would be what our compliance really. And, and I don't want to neglect basic skills, like obviously things like Network Plus, the CompTIA series. Um, you know, you need to understand how a network works, how information is transferred on a network in order to protect it. You know, it's very hard to protect something that you don't know what it is. I mean, imagine to use some sports analogies. I'm sorry, that's kind of where my mind always goes. But say, you know, you're a goaltender, a goaltender or a goalkeeper, and you don't know the size of the net behind you. Because in ice hockey, the net's rather small, right? Comparatively speaking, it's basically like the width of the player, <laughs> mostly. But in soccer or football, for our, if you have any European listeners, that net's very big. You know, that goal is, is huge. So if you're standing there being a defender and you don't know what's behind you, if it's a small net, big net, or what is it, that's really hard to defend, right? So that's why I try to explain to people, you really need to just slog through the network. I always say network plus, but some sort of networking uh, course or book whether or not you get a certificate, obviously the certificate always looks better on a resume and in an interview, but you know, ultimately it's the knowledge that you need to have. So even if you are looking for maybe only, uh, you know, on, maybe a marketing job in cybersecurity, I would still hope that people at least have some foundation in how a network works because otherwise a lot of these buzzwords then won't mean anything. So that, that's kind of how I look at it. So I did. I, I slogged through a Network Plus class. I still don't get subnet masking for the life of me. Um, yeah, I, and, and, well, the, and just a brief complaint for a second. What I had, no, so full, full truth, and I'm not, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit this. I haven't actually uh, passed the Network Plus exam myself. I did sit for it once. Um, and I did not pass it, unfortunately, because I had to take the exam right after my father died unexpectedly. I wasn't able to postpone it. And the, we'll just leave it at that. It's a whole long story. I don't feel like getting into I wasn't able to postpone it. I ha- and people said I, was, I wasn't even going to sit for it at all because I wasn't in the mindset for it. And I had a seasoned career person in InfoSec say to me, sit for it. Just know what the test is, you know, and you'll just come out of it knowing what you still need to work on and what you already know. And long story short, when I got the results, I was actually smiling and the the proctor actually had to say to me, Miss, you know, you failed, right? (laughs) And I said, no, 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 I know. I said, but I didn't fail as badly as I thought I was going to. (laughs) So I'm actually considering, you know, considering that a win and I didn't. You know, tell, I didn't spill my life story for the man, but I was just like, I've been through a lot lately. So not passing this by the percentage that I did actually feels like a, a you know, a, almost a victory to me, a moral victory. Uh, so, yeah, so that's kind of where things stood with that. But it, it's not easy, but you need to be pragmatic and you need to want it. I, I, I know there's always a big argument about whether or not you should get into cybersecurity just for the money. Um, A lot of people hate the P word of passion. You know, oh, you know, passion means nothing. Passion means you get taken advantage of. Yes, it could, especially if you see a job, you know, a job posting saying, you know, we hire for passion. That might be a red flag. But I don't see anything wrong in having passion for what you're doing. Um. But as long as you believe in it, uh, I, I have a hard time personally believing that someone who doesn't have passion for security is a good cybersecurity professional, to be honest. Because if it's just, you know, rote work for you, I, I don't know if you, are you really thinking strategically? Are you thinking of new ways to defend? Are you, you know, I, I just have a hard time understanding that if you lack passion for it, that you really can do as good of a job as someone with passion. And taking all of this information that we've gotten to skills and recognizing your own skills and your passion, it really, to me, it seems like just believing in your own abilities. 
um, without going into your specific role or your specific company or customers, it, as part of your position, what type of, sorry, I get hair everywhere. <laughs> what type of information are you, are you looking to be able to impart? You know, what really is it that you're doing with customers or other researchers? L- let me think, let me give an example from a previous job. I feel more comfortable doing that. So when I worked for a global pharmaceutical company, uh, it was one of the, one of the many jobs that I had was also just being mindful of what new threats were were out there, and it was it differed from threat intelligence because at the time they didn't have a fully formed threat intelligence team, so it was just more practical things like keeping an eye on headlines, uh, keeping an eye on on things that would affect that industry, the pharmaceutical industry, like knowing if another pharmaceutical industry was or company was compromised. Or one time I saw a news a headline that uh, some lab um, was compromised and I very quickly escalated it to find out, to ask of, do we work with this lab? Do we do things with this lab? And the answer was yes. So then it was like, okay, we'll pass that on to legal. They need to see if any information was taken. So it was the kinds of things that threat intelligence might not necessarily pick up on because sometimes they're they're focused on maybe nation state or they're focused on long term things. But a skill set that I gained as a librarian was being very much on top of the news. The one librarian job that I had, uh, I used to jokingly call it disaster watch because we were a law firm that was primarily involved with insurance. So I had to be very aware of breaking news items that could impact uh, the insurance companies that the law firm represented. So we're talking about fires, crashes, uh, you know, like the tunnel collapse in Boston, uh, things like that. So where my skill set comes in is also just being very aware of, of breaking news and quickly figuring out how that fits or doesn't fit in to where I'm working and who I'm working for and things like that. Um, Another example, again, for the pharmaceutical company that I can share is saw a headline about how a a huge publisher had a data breach. And on the surface, you'd think, well, that has nothing to do with a pharmaceutical company, except that because of my librarian experience, I knew exactly what that publisher, you know, put out as a product and part, and they put out legal, do- legal books, legal journals, and they also put out scientific journals. Well, at a pharmaceutical company, what do you have? You have scientists and you have lawyers. <laughs> and I knew that because of the prominence of this publisher, I knew that the pharmaceutical company was going to have accounts with them which meant they had our payment information, which meant they had PII from people. So I, you know, pulled a favor and I reached back into, you know, the, the abyss of my former career. And I reached out to my old sales rep from that publisher. And I said, Hey, I I saw that some stuff went down. I'm not a librarian anymore, but can you do me a solid and let me know who the sales rep is for this new company that I'm at? They were able to give that to me and I was able to connect with that sales rep and get all the pertinent information that me wearing a cybersecurity hat, blue teamer needed to know of, well, what, what information could have possibly been lost? Uh, so, and when I did present that then to bosses and higher ups, they were just blown away because none of them had ever even occurred to them. You know, one of them said to me, yeah, I saw that headline and I just dismissed it. And they actually had a substantial amount of our information, you know, at this publisher. So I hope that's a good example of, you know, kind of using, you know, transferable skills and diff- and, and this is why different thinking is crucial. You know, everybody else was dismissing this breach as not, oh, this doesn't impact us to me having, you know, sirens going off inside my head going, this is a problem. This is a problem. <laughs> I did do some. Uh, I did do some sock work, so I am familiar with the kind of research you're talking about of of you know going down rabbit holes looking for specific threats and things like that. Uh, but I'm actually more skilled in the more OSINT related research, um, and I feel like one of my skills is, like I've mentioned before, is finding an article and figuring out how it applies 
to, you know, it does it, you know, how it applies as a threat to what I'm protecting. And that's a whole different skill set. Now, the kind of research you're talking about, I mean, unless I'm really wrong here, and I don't think I am, but that requires a different level of technical knowledge, I would say. That, and I'm not saying it's impossible for someone new to do it. It's your learning curve is going to be steeper and you just have to understand that and not get discouraged by that. So by no means am I discouraging anyone or you from doing that, but you just have to understand you have to have a higher level of technical knowledge to pour through a network at a company to do that kind of research. Uh, so I'm not really too comfortable talking about that just because that's not my my wheelhouse. Um, but you can use OSINT tools to complement that research. And this is also where intercommunication skills, interpersonal skills come along. You may need to reach out to other researchers. You might belong to an ISAC. ISAC, and I'm blanking on what that stands for, but it's it's one of those, uh, it's like a consortium. Uh, so there's like, a, there's a financial ISAC, there's a health ISAC. It's a consortium of companies that come together of similar industry. And then their security folks all discuss with the understanding that, you know, it's an NDA sort of thing that like what, what happens on the ISAC message board stays on the ISAC message board. Um, and there's a lot of trust building. And then you find out that there's even smaller groups that form. That's an even tighter circle of trust that you kind of have to be vetted to, to join. Um, so yeah, you kind of have to use outside information in conjunction with what you're seeing on your network. And the reason why the interpersonal skills and the communication skills and the ISACs are important is because you need to what? You need, you need to validate that what you're seeing is either everyone is seeing it or you're only seeing it. That's, that's usually what I recall from um, the ISAC message boards from the health ISAC was usually everyone's number one question. <laughs> I'm seeing this. Are you seeing this too? And that's usually the first step someone puts out there to try and find out, is this an isolated incident? To us, is this super targeted to us, or is this all over? Uh, you know, all over the place because that kind of that that kind of alters your defense of it, right? Like it's a pretty big deal if no one else is seeing it and only you are. Um, but if everyone else is seeing it, then you can what share, um, you know, IOCs indicators of compromise to each other. You know, another company can say, oh, here's a list of IP addresses we caught on our network, and then they just hand that to you. You just block them and done. You're good. But if you're starting from scratch, you know, it's basically, yeah, it, it's like baking. Another thing that I talk and post a lot about is um, it's the difference between baking something from scratch and baking something from a box. You know, you either have all the ingredients and you know how to assemble it yourself and put it together, or someone just hands you a box of Duncan Hines and you're like, super, I'm making a cake. Okay, got it. Thanks. You know, Um so that that's kind of how that that's a big difference there that I wanted to distinguish is that, you know, doing the real technical research and, and threat hunting is a little bit different than what's more my bailiwick of expertise, which is the more OSINT and making connections and things like that. That really helps because and hopefully people don't start laughing at me, but I really thought, you know, coming into that position that whole line that you just mentioned would be my responsibility. Figure out what the threat is, what it is. And then I go do the own set and figure out how does that relate to my company and then try to set up the, you know, and I think that was one of the things that was really overwhelming me. You're, you're one part of the puzzle piece to a, a company's security defense. You know, yes, if you are at a very small shop, then yeah, you may have to be responsible for all of those steps. But it's also unrealistic for a brand new person to step into a role that has that much responsibility, uh, because obviously you wouldn't be, you know, skilled in that. So it's probably easier to pick apart which chains of that process that you feel really good with and skilled at and concentrate on that, because then that's how you sell yourself as, well, I'm a subject matter expert in this field, which is a puzzle piece to help with these other departments and these other people. 
So that's probably a better way to, to look at it rather than trying to put your arms around all of InfoSec. Just, you know, just give a little Eskimo kiss to one part of it and, <laughs> uh, and you know, make that, that your area of, of specialty. Uh, I mean, I know we've been talking for a while and you've got things to do, but I imagine somebody's on the screen just looking at it going, why didn't you ask this? Ask this for me. <laughs> so if they'd like to reach out and ask that question, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Sure. Uh, Twitter's the easiest. I'm InfoSec Sherpa. Uh, I'm, you know, happy to answer questions, you know, wi within reason. <laughs> you know, sometimes I get I get some doozies of, of questions and um, I'll just give everyone a tip now. Please don't come to me unless you've done some preliminary research. Um, I've had people, uh, I had a phone call with this this young woman one time who said to me, how do you do it? And I'm not said, I'm sorry, do what? Security. How do you do security? So yeah, this call's over. Like, no. Like <laughs> you know, I, I I need I need you to do some groundwork first. <laughs> and you know, but so yeah, like do do some research first. There see the advantage now in 2021, almost 2022, is there is a plethora of information out there. And not that it was that long ago, but I mean, six years ago when I was kicking around, there was a lot less information around or the information around was already very technical and very high level, which was confusing for a newbie. Uh, so there, I can definitely tell you, I know for a fact that there is a ton of more entry level information out there. And I encourage people to do your own research first on this and not about vaccines, <laughs> do your own research on cybersecurity. And uh, uh, for, for the vaccines, trust the medical professionals, okay? Uh, that's my little, my little social plug <laughs> here. Uh, but yeah, reach out and I'll, if I don't know an answer, chances are I know someone who does. Or if you just want something promoted that you're looking for a job, um, have a tweet ready to go that is full of information of, you know, where are you looking for a job, remote, or is it location specific? What are your skills? You know, we have what, 240 characters now in Twitter. Craft a tweet that is, you know, like a canapé of an amuse-bouche to get people enticed to learn more about you. And if you need that retweeted for visibility, I'm happy to do it. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. I learned, I, I know you were like, well, I don't know what I'm going to say. And I'm like, I, I walked away with so much from this. I will probably watch it again and start writing. I mean, I will watch it again, but start writing notes. So thank you, you guys. Feel free to reach out. I mean, like I get to do the, the YouTube thing, right? Like leave comments and we'll answer them. But, all right. Click everyone, like and subscribe. <laughs> she was not paid for that endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to hit the stop button. <laughs>